So the next uh, paper is by Mark Oliver Pohler uh, from Heidelberg Institute for Triagal Studies, and it's about testing quantile forecast optimality. As usual, you have 25 minutes and then 10 minutes for discussion and 10 minutes for Q&A. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot um, to the organizers um, for yeah, organizing this nice conference and in particular for having our, our project uh, on the menu and in general for for also including um, yeah, papers on forecast evaluation. I mean, in the poster session, we already had two nice posters on forecast evaluation, and this is, this is also a talk on forecast evaluation. And this is joint work with um, Jack Foston from King's College London and uh, Daniel Gutknecht from Goethe University Frankfurt. Um, yeah, so it's titled Testing Quantile Forecast Optimality. Um, and yeah, the motivation is, of course, Quantile forecasts are becoming more and more popular. I don't need to tell you that anymore. Um, and in economics and finance, they, they come in the forms of growth at risk, inflation at risk, value at risk. Um, and our goal is to, to evaluate quantile forecasts. And we are, yeah, in particular, focusing on um, yeah, evaluating the forecast over multiple horizons, because in practice, usually we do not forecast only for for one quarter into the future, but for many quarters. And we ideally we want to evaluate yeah, our full forecasting approach, not only a forecast for a single horizon. Okay, so this is this is what we focus on, multiple horizons. Um, and then as we've seen, for example, in the previous talk, often also not only a single quantile is of interest, but multiple quantiles, let's say, if we have prediction intervals, or if we want to um, approximate a full distribution by a set of quantiles, then we are in a multiple quantile situation. Okay, so this is a paper about multi-horizon, multi-quantile forecast evaluation. Um, and then usually forecast evaluation can be divided into two classes of approaches. The first one is relative evaluation, where you compare different forecasting approaches that we have seen a lot today. Um, yeah, compare these approaches by, by an expected loss, let's say expected quantile score. Um, this is not what we are doing. We are interested in absolute forecast evaluation where you have a single forecasting approach um, and you want to check if this is approach is in line with the data or if the forecaster uses information efficiently. Okay, and why, why should you be interested in absolute evaluation? I mean, clearly in a horse race, your best fanciest model um, yeah, can beat all other models, but also the best model can be can be very bad. And so you should always, um, at least I say that, you should always complement your relative evaluation with an absolute evaluation where you um, test that the model or the forecast fulfills some basic properties, which we usually call optimality, efficiency, or calibration, depending on the, on the literature that you come from. Okay, and that's, this is what we do. Um, we, okay, that's the delay. Um, we um, um, propose um, an optimality test, or several optimality tests for multi-horizon and multi-quantile forecasts. A little bit on the literature. I mean, there's a huge literature on, on optimality testing uh, for quantile forecasts, at least in the single horizon, single quantile case. Um, yeah, some papers are listed here, but there, there, there are many, many more. Um, and then in relative, um, when it came to relative, comes to relative evaluation, one of the organizers of this conference um, forcefully argued that, I mean, in the case of mean forecasts, but in particular in general in, for relative evaluation, you should evaluate over all forecast horizons jointly and not just consider a single forecast horizon for evaluation or or consider all the single horizons and, and do a test on them separately, but but do a joint test. And we try to do the same thing in the quantile case um, um, for absolute evaluation. Okay, what, what do we do? Um, we um, pick a specific notion of optimality, which is called, has been called auto-calibration in the literature. Um, this may be not such a familiar term, but this is essentially the notion that the 
a Minza-Sarnowitz regression tests, or in our case, a quantile Minza-Sarnowitz regression. Um, yeah, and we built on those Minza-Sarnowitz regressions to test this, this um, notion of auto calibration. We allow, as I said, for multi horizon and multi quantile forecasts. Um, our tests are based on a set, uh, finite set of moment equalities, and uh, we use bootstrap critical values. Um, and we also have some extensions. You can also test stronger forms of, of optimality or calibrations um, via augmented Minsatsanowitz quantile regressions and a multivariate version, for example, to test the forecast from the, from the previous talk. Um, you can also test um, um, quantile forecasts from multiple, from multiple variables at the same time. Okay, so we, we provide um, simulations, of course, to analyze the finite sample performance. And um, we have a macro and a finance application, so a value at risk and a, and a growth at risk application to showcase um, how our tests um, yeah, may help you in, in practice to evaluate your models. Okay, let me start um, by introducing yeah, our basic test. And before that, let's, let's look at the setup. So the goal is, of course, um, to forecast a certain quantile or multiple quantiles, but let's start with a single quantile. So our variable of interest, we call yt, let's say it's inflation. Um, the target period is called t, um, and we are, we are standing h, h periods in the past, let's say, um, that's the forecast horizon h, and we try to forecast a certain quantile, yeah, the 5% quantile, so here's a for example, the tau quantile of yt, given the information that we have in, in t minus h. Okay, so this f t minus h is the forecaster's information set. Okay, and then we denote this quantile forecast by, by y hat, and tau is the quantile level, t is the, um, the target period, and h is the forecast horizon. Okay, and now we are in this multi-horizon, multi-quantile setup, so we have forecasts, for possibly many horizons, from one to capital H, and for for possibly k, capital K different quantile levels. Okay, what is basically our null hypothesis? So, what do we want to test? Um, so, we call a, or a quantile forecast is called optimal um, with respect to the forecaster's full information set if it's equal to the true conditional quantile of yt, given the information set. This um, yeah, notion of full optimality is usually hard to test because we don't know the information set of the forecaster and it's usually large. Um, so what we test in our main test is the notion of auto calibration. Here the um, full information set of the forecaster is replaced basically by the forecast. So we condition on the information that we have in the forecast. Okay, so this is the notion that a, that a Minza-Zanowitz or a quantile Minza-Zanowitz regression tests um, optimality with respect to the information in the, contained in the forecast. So you can interpret this as um, your forecast, you should take them at face value. You should not apply some transformation to them. If they are auto-calibrated, you should take them as they are. Um, okay, this is a weaker notion of optimality, but it's also a um, an, an important property of, of, of the forecasts um, itself. Okay, so, and what do we do to test this? Um, so, we use some um, quantum and Sarzanowitz regressions. They were first introduced in this Gallianone et al. All paper um, in the quantile case. Um, so, what, what you do is very simple. You take your evaluation sample, you take the observation, the realization for YT, and you regress it on the forecast. Okay, and then if we go to the previous slide, um, the Minzatanowitz or the regression line models or estimates this conditional quantile here. And under auto calibration, you see the regression line should be equal to the forecast. So auto calibration implies the intercept should be zero, the slope should be equal to one. So this is then essentially what we formulate as our null hypothesis. Yeah, for, for all horizons that we have, for all quantile levels, we run these regressions. We have these population regressions and the, and the null hypothesis is 
intercepts are zero, slopes are equal to one. Um, yeah, and rejecting the null then implies systematic errors in the forecast, so a, a violation of this hypothesis of auto calibration. Um, and in the end, our test gives you, of course, a single test decision over your whole forecasting approach. But we can also zoom in, as we'll see in the applications, um, and see how we can possibly improve our forecasts. And the, and the first way that we can zoom in is we can look at the contributions of single quantiles or horizons or quantile horizon combinations to our test statistic to see where do the problems lie. Is it uh, further into the future when you forecast further into the future or, or is it at outer quantiles? Um, and we can also look at the estimated Minzatzanowitz regression lines um, yeah, to, to get an idea in, in which direction we should yeah, try, to, try to improve our forecasts. We'll see that in the applications. Okay, so we have an evaluation sample of forecasts in the end. So the evaluation sample um, has size P um, as stand standard in the literature, this notation, I guess. Um, and we have a matrix valued, so the, the forecasts are matrix valued because I mean, we, have, we have these multiple horizons, we have these multiple um, quantiles. Yeah, so in the end, we have the forecasts and the realizations. And we run all the, we estimate all those quantile regressions, the Minzatzanowitz quantile regressions, save the coefficients that we estimated. And then the test statistic just takes the deviation um, of the estimated coefficients from their values under the null. Okay, so estimated intercept minus zero, so the estimated intercept, and estimated slope minus, minus one under the null. Um, and these are the empirical moments that we use, these m hats, and then we basically just sum them up, scale them up by the evaluation sample size, and square them. Um, and this is the test statistic. You, so you can interpret this test statistic as a, yeah, basically summing up the distance from all those, from the regression lines under the null to the, to the estimated regression lines. Okay, so the asymptotic distribution of this um, thing here, of course, depends on the variance covariance matrix, so on the dependence between all those estimated coefficients. Um, and we do not estimate the, the variance covariance matrix. We use um, a bootstrap implementation, so um, a moving block bootstrap. Um, yeah, and we take the critical values from this moving block bootstrap, um, and we establish the validity, of course, of this bootstrap um, under certain assumptions. In particular, we assume that the evaluation sample and the estimation sample, if, we have, if you have an estimated model, um, um, that they both go to infinity, but the um, estimation sample dominates the, the evaluation sample. Um, okay, so this is our basic testing procedure. Um, yeah, let's shortly look at, at the two extensions that we, that we also provide. Five? Ten. Okay, so <laughs> this was, was a bit short. Okay, so um, I mean, you can also um, try to test stronger forms of optimality where you do not only um, evaluate the forecast conditional uh, on, on the information contained in themselves, but yeah, in, in principle, you could test full optimality, so with respect to the full information set, but then you would have to include all the variables from the full information set into the regression. So um, you can then run augmented Minzatzanowitz regression where you, if you think that some variable is important for forecasting the other variable, then you can check if this variable Z or this vector of variable Z, um, if the information from this was incorporated efficiently. Okay, so this would then be a stronger form of, um, of calibration or optimality. And here the null would be um, the same as before, but the coefficients on these additional variables should be zero because the forecasts on the right-hand side under the null already efficiently incorporate all the information. Um, okay, and rejecting this null would mean that the additional variables contain additional information which, which are useful in, in forecasting and should be incorporated into, into your models. Okay, and the other extension is, um, yeah, if you just have multiple variables and quantile forecasts for them, you, our approach extends straightforwardly in, in that direction. Um, okay, 
then let's look at the two empirical applications. The first one is a value at risk application from finance. This is more about the basic test, application of the basic test. And the second application is, is a macro application, which is multivariate and where we also apply the, the other extension of the augmented Minzitzanowitz regression. Um, okay. I mean, in financial risk management, um, value at risk is, is of course important. Um, and usually, yeah, you want to you have a single level for value at risk, but there's no real consensus, which is the right level, 1%, 2.5% or 5%, let's say. Um, and more modern risk measures like expected shortfall basically look at the, look at the information in the, in the full tail. So yeah, you could be interested in multiple quantiles, let's say but you are definitely interested in multi-horizons. When you do risk management, you are not only interested in, in risk management for the next day. So our approach is naturally suited to this, to this financial risk management setup. Um, and we use uh, in our application daily S&P 500 returns with a standard GARCH 1.1 model. Um, as we had that several times today, we generate the multi-step ahead quantile predictions um, by the Scotch bootstrap by Pascal et al. That's basically resampling um, from, uh, from your estimated residuals to, to simulate forward from the model and then take the empirical quantize from that. Um, the data span from 2000 to 2022. Um, and we use, use a recursive window of, of initial estimation size 3000. We go up to 10 horizons. So from horizon one to 10 over all those horizons. We forecast and we take those three quantile levels here, one, 2.5 and 5%. Um, as a block length for the bootstrap, we use 10. Um, and yeah, we do some robustness checks, which do not really, really change the results qualitatively. So um, here, there's just a picture um, of the realizations. Um, and those three quantile forecasts for the first horizon. Remember, we, we do go up to 10 horizons. And I mean, this is the output of our test. So we have a test statistic, a value of the test statistic, the, the bootstrap critical values, and here's the bootstrap p value, so it's 1%. So I mean, the test gives us a decision. Our model, there's strong evidence that, that this uh, risk, manager, risk management forecasting model is not uh, auto-calibrated. Okay, that's the overall decision. That's what we wanted. But of course, we can now zoom in and um, look at, um, at the contributions to the test statistic um, from single horizon quantile combinations. Yeah, so you see inside the table, or from single from a single um, quantile down here, or from a single horizon. And if you look um, for a longer time at this, you will see that. Um, for the outer quantiles, um, uh, the, the, the deviations from the null um, are, um, are larger. So 5% of predictions seem to be okay from the Scotch model. For the outer quantiles, it gets a bit more, um, the, the test statistic gets larger, or larger contributions. Um, and for the, the smaller horizons, war, H being equal to one or two, there is not so much um, evidence inter, um, against auto calibration as for the, for the larger horizons. Thanks. Okay. Um, what you can also do, you can look at individual p-values that you, that you get with our test, only testing single horizon quantile combinations or single quantiles or, or horizons. We have that here, the, the individual p-values. But why do I show that? Um, I, I showed it to you to, to to make clear what you would have if you didn't have a joint test. You would have all those individual p-values and you would have to combine them. So this is what, what's the yeah, a major benefit of our approach. You have this, this overall testing decision, the p-value of 1%, and you do not need to find a way to combine all those p-values. Well, this is the way that, that we give you. Okay, one more way to zoom in, as I promised you. You can look at individual uh, Minzatzanowitz regression lines because you have estimated them. So for a specific horizon and a specific quantile, let's say for those cases that contribute most strongly to the rejection. Um, so here's a scatter plot of forecasts and realizations. Um, and um, the orange line is the diagonal. So here we have the, um, the forecasts. 
for the one percent quantile this is and for for h being equal to one so here we have the forecast on the diagonal essentially the one percent quantile forecast if the <laughs> area and the, the mensah tanowitz regression line gives you the auto calibrated forecasts so the for, how where the forecast should have been if they if they were to be auto calibrated and then you can can see yeah, for example um here in the more extreme cases um we are too conservative the the, the quantile forecasts are too low they they wouldn't need to be so low of course this is a linear this is a linear regression you could do that um, non parametrically um, but this is not the focus here. But you can get some idea on how you should improve your quantile forecasts um, by looking at those regression lines. Okay, to finish off, um, let's look at the macro application. Um, yeah, I don't need to give you a motivation on quantile forecasting in macro. Um, we explore optimality of model-based forecasts of, of four U.S. macro variables, the same variables as in Mansan 2015, who was one of the first probably to, to consider quantile forecasting in, in macro, um, and we use monthly, not quarterly variables. Um, and we look at um, two inflation variables, the first one here and the, the last one, and uh, industrial production and employment, so two real variables. And um, we use the classical quantile autoregressive distributed lag model by, by, or not by ABG, but that they also use. We regress those variables on an autoregressive term and on the National Financial Conditions Index of the Chicago Fed. Um, um, we use the FRED monthly data um, from 1984 on. Um, we have 432 observations. We split the sample in half um, for the initial estimation sample. And we go up to 12 horizons into the future, so one year, 12 months. And we use the 10% quantile, 25 and percent quantile and the median. Here, the block length for the block bootstrap is four. Um, and now let's look at this, um, this multivariate version of the test. So jointly, the quantile forecasts for all the quantiles over all the horizons for all the variables, we get a p-value of about 7%. So there's some evidence that not all those forecasts are auto-calibrated. And then we can also look at the individual series. And here we see, interestingly, that the two real variables, industrial production and um, um, employment, there is not, not really evidence against auto-calibration. P-values are larger than 10%. For the two inflation variables, there is more, more evidence with a P-value of essentially 10% and, and zero, more evidence for for miscalibration, so one takeaway could be the ABG approach for GDP growth, yeah, is, is more or less okay because it's about the real variable, but for the inflation variables, inflation at risk, maybe you should, you should look for a different model. Um, okay, um, I mean, you could also zoom in like we did for the other application, we don't do that now. Um, let's look at the other extension, the augmented Minsatsanowitz test where we check if, here, here we check if one of the other variables um, contains uh, useful information um, because we just include the three other variables um, um, in the augmented Mensah-Tanowitz regression. And then, of course, the, um, the inflation variables got a rejection for the v canal hypothesis of autocalibration. They still get a rejection, but for the um, real variables, yeah, we don't get a rejection the other variables do not seem to carry important information um, about um, yeah, the, the, the two real variables here. So no improvement of the forecast possible via including the other um, variables in the model. Okay, great. So um, what we did, we proposed I mean, Satsanowitz type test for quantile forecast optimality at multiple horizons and multiple quantile levels, which we think is yeah, practically very relevant. We provided those two extensions for a stronger form of, auto, of calibration for the wide augmented Satsanowitz test and the extension to multiple time series. Um, yeah, simulation evidence that I didn't show you today shows that um, the tests work well in, in finite samples, and we have yeah, these two large empirical applications to illustrate the, 
the usefulness of the tests. Yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mark. The discussant is uh, Laura Coroneo from the University of York. It has been really a pleasure sorry, to, to read the paper. And uh, uh, I'm going to just start with uh, um, just a small introduction um, saying what the paper does. So this is a test essentially for misspecification for multiple quantile forecasts at multiple, multiple forecasting horizon. And uh, what the paper does is that it builds on multiple means that are with quantile regressions cast in a moment equality framework. So um, essentially, um, when we do in general forecast evaluation, uh, in the case of point forecast, we do forecast evaluation uh, horizon by horizon. So, or if we are in a quantile type of forecast, we do quantile by quantile. What this paper does is that it proposes a procedure that we can test uh, for uh, um, a specification, do, we can do specification tests uh, jointly for all the quantiles at all the forecasting uh, horizons. Uh, and the main test is for this null hypothesis of auto calibration, which is optimality with respect to the information contained into the uh, forecast themselves, but it also proposes two extensions. One is the extension uh, for optimality with respect to larger information sets, so with the augmented uh, means quantile, mean interzano with regression. And the other one, which I think is more interesting and more relevant for the work we've seen in this, uh, uh, in this workshop, is for auto calibration for multiple series. Uh, so if we have a model that provides us forecasts for multiple series, each at different forecasting horizons and for different quantiles. So what they're proposing is a test that allows us to test for the specification of the model jointly for all the series, for all the quantiles, and for all the forecasting horizons. So I'm very enthusiastic about this paper. Uh, so uh, let me uh, go a bit into the, um, the definition of uh, auto calibration it is uh, used. So here, uh, we have that uh, uh, soy forecast, which is indicated by y hat at, for the uh, variable at time t um, made h period ahead and for quantile tau, is auto calibrated if it is equal to the conditional quantile of the variable at y t, conditional on the information set that was used to, uh, to make the forecast, that is contained into the forecast itself. So what the paper proposes is to use this quantile means that Zarnovitz regressions, which means essentially that it regresses the, um, it does a quantile regression of the variable of interest, essentially yt, on the forecast. And if the forecast is auto-calibrated, what you should have is that alpha, so the intercept, should be zero and beta should be one for all the quantiles and for all the forecasting horizons. So this is the null hypothesis of the test. So the null hypothesis is a joint hypothesis that all the alphas and all the betas, so all the alphas are equal to zero and all the betas are equal to one for all the quantiles and all the forecasting horizons. The alternative hypothesis is that at least one alpha or one beta are different than zero for some forecasting horizons or conditional quant or sorry or um, quantile yes so um, since um, the paper uses this uh, uh, quantile means that Zarnovitz test is natural to estimate alpha and beta using quantile regression. So this is what the paper essentially does. So once you estimate the alpha and betas in quantile regression, so the paper says, okay, um, here we have that this is what we get our estimate and this is what we have under the null hypothesis, right? So the alphas should all be equal to zero and the betas should all be equal to one. So these are what are, the moment conditions that we have essentially, and they have this distribution. So if you want to do a world test, what you would have to do is essentially to construct a test statistic that normalizes for this variance. What they say is that this can be, um, so this, uh, the dimensionality of the problem can become big if you have many quantiles and many forecasting horizons, and even more if you want to go multivariate. So let's go the other way around. So what they do is that they propose essentially to sum up all the elements in this moment condition. So all these here to square them. So first to square them and then to sum them all up. Okay. So 
this distribution, this test statistic, sorry, this is the test statistic. Where did it go? Sorry. Here. So this, this test statistic uh, is non-pivotal because we didn't, uh, we don't have, we didn't normalize for the variance, right? So um, we need uh, to uh, compute critical values using bootstrap. So what they use, uh, I didn't go too much into details in the uh, presentation, but they use moving block bootstrap directly from the forecast. Um, and then, of course, it's assumed that the estimation sample is large enough and that the estimation error is irrelevant. Um, and then, um, as uh, Mark said, they propose two extensions. One is the augmented quantile means of Zanovitz, in which essentially they test efficiency with respect to a larger information set by adding additional regressors into the quantile regression and adding the hypothesis that the coefficients on these additional regressors should be zero. And then the multivariate one that is for multiple variables. Um, okay, so my comments. Uh, um, general comment is that this is a very interesting paper and addresses an important issue that is very relevant for whoever has to make decisions about which forecast to use, uh, which model you select. Um, so I think that this is the best place to present this paper. And as I already said, uh, when you have multiple forecasting horizons, multiple quantiles, uh, then uh, the dimensionality of the problem can become big very easily, and especially if you go multivariate. So a world test is not feasible. So I think that uh, they, um, they got around the problem in a very smart way, uh, proposing a feasible test statistic that has uh, good properties. Uh, I have essentially uh, three comments. So the first one is about Bootstrap, then the Monte Carlo, which was not into the uh, presentation, and then on the PIC application. First, uh, this is, I don't know if it's a comment or a clarification, but this was the same also in the presentation. So reading the paper, it's not clear to me how the bootstrap is implemented. Uh, because in the auto calibration test, uh, you said that you uh, bootstrap resample jointly the observation and the quantile for each tau, so which I think that you do multiple times. While instead in the multivariate extension, it looks that you take them jointly. So my view would be that they should always be taken jointly. So you should resample jointly always all the quantiles and all the forecasting horizons. So I don't know if this was just how it was written or how you're doing it, so that's the question. And second, uh, in the paper they are not, um, the, 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 the bootstrap is described for the case of auto calibration, but then uh, it's skipped a bit in the other two extensions. But in the case where you have uh, the augmented means of Zarnovitz uh, regression, maybe you could specify also how you treat the conditioning variables. Do, do you resample them or do you keep them as fixed? Um, so this is about the bootstrap. And then I think my um, main comments are about the, uh, the Monte Carlo simulations. So I think there is lots of scope to expand the Monte Carlo in the paper because it is quite uh, tiny and uh, it's good to have new tools, but you know, a new tool is not like a new game. You want to see how much it works, when it works, and which are the rules of the game somehow, right? So um, now uh, the, the, the Monte Carlo that we have in the paper looks at, uh, let's say, two sample sizes and uh, uh, three choices for uh, the block selection in the block bootstrap. Um, but for example, the autocorrelation coefficient the data generating process is fixed to 0.6. Um, so how has this number been chosen? And maybe, you know, uh, the finite sample size depends on this, uh, 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 this autocorrelation. So it would be interesting to see how, like, the properties of the test change if you have different autocorrelation in, uh, um, in the data generating process. And then also for um, uh, when you look at the sites, of course, you use the correct uh, um, um, autoregressive coefficient. When you use a power, you use a larger, so 0 0.8 autocorrelation. But uh, it would be interesting to explore how uh, the power of the test depends on the deviation. So, um, so how wrong you are from, uh, you know, the null hypothesis uh, uh, then, um, uh, or the data generating process. So how does the power depend on this deviation? And maybe if the power depends also on the autocorrelation of the process. Um, and then um, also uh, there are um, three choices of block selection. 
but then these are used in the Monte Carlo, but for the empirical application, um, for one, the one in the, with the uh, financial data, the, the value at risk, uh, the block it is chosen is not included in the Monte Carlo. So, and my view is that most likely the block depends on the autocorrelation, so coefficient. So maybe uh, this is something could be also be explored. Um, and then point two, which I think is relevant. So it's an um, interesting approach that allows you to test lots of moment conditions. I would be interested to know how far we can go. So now in the Monte Carlo, you have three quantile levels and four uh, horizons, so like 12 moment conditions. When does the test break, right? So, so can we go up to 20, to 50, 100? So this is also interesting to know, especially for whoever wants to apply the test. And then, uh, since we are in a central bank, we deal with macro data. The smallest sample size in the um, in the Monte Carlo is 120. So, you know, with quarterly data, indeed, in your uh, um, um, application in macro, you use monthly data, right? But if you want to use quarterly data, 120 is a lot. So, what happens if you have smaller sample sizes? Uh, and then my final comment is the, in the big application. So I like a lot this idea of recalibrating the forecast, and I think this could be explored a bit more in the paper. Uh, so to look how these recalibrated forecasts, what they look like, and how you could combine the recalibration that you do for different quantiles at different forecasting horizons. Um, and then since I think I'm almost out of time, these are minor points I can tell you uh, later. Uh, I want just to say that this is a very interesting paper uh, that in addresses a very important issue and proposes three, three tests, one for auto-calibration, one for optimality with respect to larger information set, and auto-calibration for multiple series. And to conclude, I want to say that the paper has a hidden gem in the appendix, which is uh, uh, the horizon monotonicity test, which I find very interesting. And it's a bit um, frustrating for it to be in the appendix. So I was wondering if you could maybe put it aside in another paper and do Monte Carlo and empirical application, because I found that very interesting. Uh, I know that appendices, they, um, they evolve with the paper, so I wonder why it's in the appendix. Um. Should I say again, John Paris ECV? <laughs> uh, no, very nice presentation, many thanks. Actually, I was now inspired also by one poster that it was outside, which was about combination of the quantiles. And we are always struggling, as you said, you know, how to combine models and what horizon within one or two years. So is this just a direct application that we can do? Have you thought about combination of you know, quantile models using this information because now you can combine with an optimality, you know, with a function, with optimizes over horizons, right, for example. Thank you. Back. Julia Mantoan, Bank of England. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, um, I don't know if I missed the point, but how do do your tests solve the problem of multiple hypothesis testing, especially in the multi-horizon uh, dimension? Uh, and then I was wondering whether uh, it makes a difference how you compute the, horizon, the, um, the forecast horizon. So if it's a, it's a direct forecast or indirect forecast, if you see any difference, I guess no, but I'll let you answer. Thank you. Thank you. Points. Yeah, thank you for the clear presentation. Uh, to me, the, the, the test is a bit non-constructive. So if, uh, if the test rejects, then, uh, then that's too bad for the modeler. But to me, it's, there's no no guidance on which which part of the specification I should now change for the for the test to uh, to to uh, to indicate a, a good model specification, and one way to to perhaps be more constructive is uh, for me to know whether the test just rejected because the alphas are not are, are not zero, or whether the test rejected because the slope coefficients are not equal to one. So perhaps one can disentangle the test statistic and then. I would know why the test rejected. Thank you. Um, 
so pushing on this and uh, the point was made uh, by Juan um, indeed it would be interesting to have uh, a way instead of a testing model in a way to combine different quantile estimates and uh, then you also solve this issue you know if you take the perspective that any model is misspecified then this could be one way to uh, aggregate different uh, forecasts and I guess it's linked to the post session that uh, I've seen before. And another question on, on time horizon, there are many ways to look at the time horizon. One is to look from T, from T minus H to T, but it can also do, uh, you know, each step at a time. There may be, although they're not, uh, um, you cannot sum them, but there can be value, right, in uh, seeing whether the model is doing a good job also estimating from uh, uh, T minus two to T minus three and uh, so forth, all these small uh, uh, steps, forecasting steps, instead of just, just doing one direct uh, forecast. Okay, um, yeah, thanks a lot, Laura, for this uh, very nice discussion and thanks for all your questions and comments. Um, I'll try to answer um, most of them. Um, so the first question was uh, on the on the joint resampling. Um, yeah, I think this is not written clearly in the paper. We jointly resample the observation and the whole matrix of, of forecasts. Um, so, um, then, um, okay, and the resampling of the of the additional regressors and the minsa reg uh, augmented regressions this was a bit complicated. Um, I would have to to, to check to, to check how, how we did that. Um, yeah, but it's not, yeah, yeah, it's not, it should be extended in the paper, probably the description of that. Um, yeah, I mean, all the, the comments on the simulations, um, yeah, I take with me and this we well discuss them with my co-authors. Yeah, definitely they are, um, they are a bit brief, the simulations, but actually for submission, we. We put all of them in the appendix, so <laughs> um, yeah, but they, they could be extended definitely. Um, yeah, and this is also what the referees remarked, um, but something that you said, um, for the, we have a, a simulation that is more tailored to the macro application, not to the finance application, and yeah, we will have more simulations which are, which are from a gauge model. Um, um, we, we chose the block length for the bootstrap there um, longer because this, the time series is just longer for the for the for the financial series and the, the dependence is probably stronger than in the macro case. Um, but we'll have simulations backing that up. Um, okay, then um, yeah, two two very interesting comments. The two last ones. Um, so on recalibration, um, maybe I'll explain that shortly. So the mensa tanois regression line, we've seen one picture. It gives you, it in a way tells you how the forecast should have looked like if they were auto-calibrated because it estimates the auto-calibrated forecast from the actual forecast. And this is then in the literature, um, for mean forecast or in, in other literatures like the meteorological one, it's called recalibration. So taking forecasts and manipulating them in a way that they that they come better, um, let's say. Um, yeah, we are thinking of a follow, about the follow-up project where we take yeah, forecasts from structural economic models like DSGE models and try to recalibrate them because they are interpretable, but maybe the forecast accuracy is not as, as good as for statistical models. Yeah, for statistical models, yeah, I'm not sure if this, this leads to much improvement. And then you also have the problems of gradual structural change and will the coefficients that you estimate based on the past really help you to recalibrate your current forecasts? Yeah, but that's certainly something interesting that we, that we look into. Um, yeah, and then we also have this horizon monotonicity test in the appendix that I didn't mention. Thanks for mentioning it. So this is essentially also a test for optimality, which, I mean, we have this quantile score. We have seen this a lot today and the expected quantile score should, um, should increase over the horizons because the forecast accuracy should get should get worse the further into the future you forecast because you just should have less information um, 
about 10, 10 periods into the future than about tomorrow, let's say. Um, and we, we just propose a test for the, uh, we have a test for that, which is from a technical point of view, maybe more involved than, than this one. Um, but yeah, usually when you look at forecasts in practice, the, um, the loss is increasing over the horizon. So sometimes you have a non-monotonicity there, but that's probably noise. So we, we didn't really find uh, suitable applications for that test. So we, we put it into the appendix. Um, yeah. Okay, then um, the question on quanta combination or combination of quanta forecasts. Yeah, probably should ask Julia. I'm not an expert on that really. But yeah, you could use this, as a, let's say, augmented Minzer-Zahnowitz approach and regress, uh, run a regression of, of your Y variable on, on different quantile uh, forecasts. And this, this would give you a linear combination of them. But I'm sure someone has tried that already. I don't have a reference, but. That's probably the simplest thing to do. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, I'm not too too much into that literature. Um, so then, uh, your question was uh, how how we we solve the multiple testing problem. Um, I mean, in the end, we give you one p-value, and if you had a test for every single horizon and every single quantile, you had many p-values, and you would have to combine them. And a Bonferroni correction or something like that. We know that it's you lose a lot of power basically doing that. So here we, we don't lose lose power, I would say. That's, yeah, that's maybe the main contribution um, that we that we solved this problem. Um, then I didn't really get it. There's no difference if the, depending on, so if the forecasts are direct or indirect, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't matter for our test. We take the forecasts as, as primitives as, as we see, so we don't, we don't go the, it doesn't matter from where they come, let's say. We, we take just, just the forecasts, we take them as given. Um, okay, so then, um, yeah, the comment that the test is non-constructive. Um, <laughs> it's essentially, yeah, we have a p-value in the end which tells you nothing, so it gives you a, de a decision uh, on a statistical problem as, or on a decision problem as, as you want. But um, yeah, then I, I tried to show in the applications that we can zoom in in a way and look at the test statistic is nicely interpretable in a distance kind of way. And you can look at the contributions of different horizons or quantiles or combinations of them. I mean, this, this can give you a, a flavor of, of where something goes wrong. Um, maybe every, at every horizon and quantile, you, you have, a, have a problem, okay? But uh, yeah, this can give you a flavor and then um, yeah, as you said, you can look at the single Minzer-Zahnowitz regressions and you can look at the coefficients or you can even plot the regression lines and see, um, see what is going, so how it deviates from the, from the diagonal. Um, if I wanted to do that, I would use a non-parametric approach on that that's done in the statistical or meteorological literature. Um, so this, this scatter plot of observations and, and forecasts, and, and then you estimate this regression line non-parametrically, the Minzer-Zahnowitz regression line, that's called a reliability diagram or calibration plot in, the, in this literature. It's, it's, it's a fairly new tool for quantile regression, I would say, but you could, you could always do that um, and then see um, um, what, this, what this tells you where your forecasts could be improved. And wouldn't take the linear regression line literally as I said, because it's only a linear regression and we have structural change and so on, but you could get some, some um, ideas on how to improve your forecasts. Um, so, um, yeah, um, yeah, this was also your, your first question, I guess, and I would have to think about the, the second one, so, um, so the, gradual, the gradual forecasting um, might also be interesting to think about how to evaluate them. Well, thank you. Thank you a lot, Mark, and thanks to all the speakers.